people are a military people, male and female. My revenue is the proceeds of the sale of prisoners of war. All my nation, all are soldiers, and the slave trade feeds them. <laughs> This is how a powerful West African ruler described his kingdom to a British soldier in the middle of the last century. It's no secret that European traders shipped roughly 11 million Africans to the New World from this very coast. My own great-great-grandmother was one of those Africans. In so many ways, the slave trade has shaped what America is and who I am. There are two things that have always haunted me. The brutality of the European traders and the stories I've heard about Africans selling other Africans into slavery. Hey, my brother, how you doing? I've come to Ghana, to the town of Elmina, to find out what really happened along this coast. This was the first European slave trading post in all of sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, it feels very Mediterranean here. You can certainly feel the influence of the Portuguese and the Spanish. 500 years ago, the Portuguese came here searching for gold, but they found a far more valuable commodity, human beings. They also found powerful kingdoms whose rulers were happy to trade. Elmina was already a thriving market town, but it grew dramatically with the slave trade. From Elmina, I'm heading inland away from the coast and the European slave ports to Kumasi, the capital of the Kingdom of Ashanti. From there I'll travel east on the trail of the notorious kings of Dahomey. Then I'll make my way back to the coast to Ouida, to the most infamous slave port of them all. Ouida saw the last slave ship leave West Africa hardly more than a century ago. I'm typical of African Americans of my generation. I'm obsessed with tracing my roots. For 200 years, many of my people had fantasies about coming back to Africa to live. Some actually did. But not everybody stayed. The Ghanaians tell the funniest story about the relationship between Africans and African Americans. 1957, Kwame Nkrumah became the first president of Ghana. He had been educated in the United States. He loved black Americans. He invited all black Americans to come back to Ghana, think of Ghana as their home. All these black Americans arrived in Accra about 1960. When they got here, they came to this beach. And right out there at that reef, they would um, they'd gather at midnight, and they would say these magic ritualistic words from the Ashanti rituals. And then they would take their passports and fling them as far out beyond that barrier as they could smack their hands, say they had gotten rid of uh, American racism and they were home on the mother continent. Six weeks later, the Ghanaians that lived just around this beach um, noticed under this full moon all these shadows on, on the beach. And so they didn't know what was going on. They thought maybe they were being invaded by another country. So they got their torches and they came down to the beach. And they looked around and what they found, those same black Americans <laughs> out beyond that barrier searching for those passports. <laughs> we feel at home here because we're surrounded by black people. That's why we come. But the memory of slavery and of what our ancestors must have gone through is always lurking. Even a pretty little harbor town like Elmina is dominated by its slave castle. And for us, a slave castle is like Auschwitz. Right in here. Just 
very dungeon housed between 150 and 200 women for three good months. This is where they slept, yes. But the place was much overcrowded. So there wasn't enough space for one even to lie down. The result was an outbreak of malaria and yellow fever. So by the time the ships arrived, more than half were already dead. Well, this is the infamous room of no return. That is also the door of no return. When the slaves got here, they never knew where they were going. Neither did they know what was going to happen to them. All they knew was to get out of this room onto the boats. Some actually committed suicide. Because that was the only way they thought they could get their freedom. In fact, it was the Africans who did the raiding and selling of Africans to the Europeans. No European ever went into the hinterland to raid for slaves. It was the Africans who did it. And bef be before the Europeans even landed here, slavery was already in the system. It was slaves that worked in the palaces for the kings. I thought it was more, even at that time, than just money. It had to be just some, just something else that drove them to just kill these people. Yeah, why brutalize them like that? Why brutalize? Them? But then again, I guess that's that's justification on rationalization. If you brutalize it, then you have to say to yourself, "There's no way we, as a Christian people, could brutalize other humans, so they can't be humans." But did it surprise you when you found out that Africans were involved as well as middlemen? Um, the thing, I, I knew that Africans were involved. I didn't know the extent to what they were involved. And I also didn't know that once they found out what was going on here, and, and I know that they had to know what was going on here, that they stayed a willing participant in it. That, that's the crazy part of it. I think I was surprised and hurt and angry and everything because, you know, these were people that, you know, you know I sort of had a fantasy about them and and as our ancestors and your ancestors don't sell you so that fantasy was sort of blown away and i i was i was uh yeah i, I had a, a whole range of emotions. this isn't my first visit to a slave castle but it is the first time i've heard a tour guide be so explicit about the role of the africans most of us come here to beat up on the europeans and god knows they deserve it i'm actually surprised at how honest he was Dr. Akosua Purby teaches African history and is specialized in the slave trade. The Europeans came to Africa in the 15th century. And when they arrived, they found a well-knit political system in Africa. A well-made political system? Yes, well-knit political system. In other words, they were centralized it with kings, chiefs, well-established political systems. They also found that there was a well-established economic system in terms of trading and so on. And so they recognized who the Africans were. And it was, they found strong states, kings who were ready to negotiate with them on equal basis and partnership basis, hmm. both in their trade and so on. And in fact, when the Europeans started building their forts and castles, they asked permission from the kings to build their land, to build their forts, and then they paid rent for their forts. So they needed, as it were, the Africans to agree on equal basis or partnership basis to enslave their fellow Africans. So if Africans had not sold other Africans to the Europeans, there wouldn't have been a slave trade? I think so. Because the Africans were strong enough, if they had said no, perhaps the Europeans themselves would have tried to go inland, and that would have been very, very difficult. When I come to Africa, you know the first thing that comes to my mind? What would my life be like if my ancestors hadn't been enslaved? Mm -hmm. What would I be? Maybe you would have been a chief in Asante Mampong. <laughs> <laughs>
I like being chief. Yeah, you're uh, chief, and people have called you Nana, 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 Brebre, Nana, Brebre, Nana, Brebre. Nana, Nana, Brebre, Nana, Brebre, Nana Brebre. <laughs> It's a nice idea, but if my ancestors had been chiefs, it's not very likely that they would have ended up in chains on a slave ship. It's more likely that they'd have been selling slaves and buying guns. Hey, my brother, how you doing? Which way to Kumasi bus? Kumasi, down there? I'm headed inland to Kumasi, the capital of Ashanti. This was one of the powerful kingdoms heavily involved in the slave trade. This was called the Great Road, which cut straight through the forest, all the way from the coast to Kumasi. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the Ashanti Empire covered an area bigger than Britain. Very few Europeans were allowed to travel into the interior. They needed the permission of the king, and he rarely granted it. Once in a while, nervous reports would reach the coast. The Ashanti army is numerous beyond belief. More than 60,000 men, acquainted with the use of firearms, ready to sacrifice their lives to the nod and caprice of their king, who is known to be savage and cruel in the extreme. Driving through Kumasi's lush suburbs, it's difficult to imagine all those ferocious warriors. But the Ashanti royal family still has a lot of power, even if they don't have an army to command. <laughs> 